y'all, howdy. Welcome to One for the Books. I'm Sandra Broadwell, and today we're gonna to be doing a tier ranking of everything that I read and watched in quarter one of 2024. So January, February, and March. I'm not gonna go over things that I have re-watched, but I did keep track of things that were new to me in quarter one. So I will try to keep this brief. I've already talked about all of these books on my channel, so I will make sure to link all of the wrap-ups or other videos where I talked about these books down below. For the movies, I'll go into a little bit more detail just because I haven't talked about them on my channel before, but I will try to keep all of this fairly brief because I think we have 41 things to talk about. 31 of those are books and I think 10 are movies or TV shows. Let's dive in. So I only have four tiers on this list because I haven't really read or watched anything I would consider bad so far this year, so good for me. <laughs> A new fave, great, a good time or mediocre. <laughs> and if you've ever seen tier rankings before, the tier ranking software kind of just scrambles everything that goes in here. So I didn't put these in any particular order. But first up we have a Quiet Place Part 2. So I also have a Quiet Place Part 1 in here. So let me actually find that one just so I can talk about it. But yeah, A Quiet Place is a horror movie that is my favorite type of horror, which is just like speculative or sci-fi horror. And it is Emily Blunt and John Krasinski as the main actors. I thought this was really great. I was really pleasantly surprised. It came out several years ago and um, I just don't usually prioritize horror, but I think there's even a third one coming out, which is a prequel later this year sometime. So that's exciting. A Quiet Place Part 2. Yeah, I think I would think I would still consider it great. My threshold for like what is great in horror is probably not as fine tuned as big horror connoisseurs because I don't consume a lot of horror, but I would say as far as sci-fi horror goes, this is in the best of what I have seen. Then we have a movie called The Creator, which is a film that I thought the trailer looked really good and so I just decided to watch it on a whim. I hadn't really heard anyone else talking about it, but it is about future sort of dystopian world in which there was a war between humans and robots or like sentient AI type people and there is a child born who is like the most advanced robotic person ever and a man that is contracted to kill it and the relationship that he develops with it as he like develops feelings for the child. I thought this had a lot of really, really high potential and I thought some of the story elements and the sci-fi like special effects were really, really cool. And overall though, it just fell really flat. Like the acting was not good. The reality of the film didn't live up to the potential. So I'm gonna say that one was mediocre. Then we have The Girl and the Moon by Mark Lawrence. This is the third book in the Book of the Ice trilogy. So let me find the first one is The Girl and the Stars. The Girl and the Stars, I would say is mediocre, unfortunately. I was really looking forward to this series because it is a companion series to the Book of the Ancestor, which I read by Mark Lawrence a couple of years ago. And I loved the Book of the Ancestor. I thought it was super duper cool. And f overall, I just felt like this companion series just kind of fell flat. It didn't really add a whole lot to the world. The pacing, especially in book one, was all over the place. I felt like it was all way too fast and didn't give anything really time to breathe or develop. So that was my least favorite one in the series. The Girl and the Mountain was the second one. I'm still gonna put this in mediocre, I think, because it was just a bit stilted. The f whole plot of the book, what I thought was the plot of the book, all wrapped up within the first half of the book and then the second half, was kind of a quest that just felt like getting from point A to point B. And then The Girl on the Moon, I do feel like was the best of the series. Um, so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna put these in reverse order. I do, I did like all of these better than I liked The Creator, but I did think it got better with every book. So the first one, The Girl on the Stars at the end, and then The Girl on the Moon, which is the last one at the top of Mediocre. Not that these weren't, I still like, I still enjoyed them, but I wouldn't really recommend them to people who are not already fans of Book of the Ancestor. Then we have Bird by Bird by Anne Lamont. This is a nonfiction book that is like writing advice and 
also kind of uh, this woman's memoir. And I thought it was a good time. I, yeah, she had some really great like kernels of wisdom in there, but I wouldn't consider it great necessarily just because her writing advice was really prescriptive in a way that made it seem like if you don't write the same way that she does, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and I just don't subscribe to that. Parable of the Talents, great. So this is the second book of the Earthseed duology, which starts with the Parable of the Sower. And Parable of the Sower is going up in new fave because holy moly, <laughs> this series like really is probably the best dystopian story that I have ever read. I'm putting Parable of Talents lower than Parable of the Sower, but in my mind, they're honestly kind of the same book because they're just one continuous story. There were some things about Parable of the Talents that I didn't quite like as much, just in that it brought in another perspective of the main character from the first book's daughter, and I felt like I wanted more in that regard. But absolutely, Parable of the Sower, like I said, it's really gruesome, it's really gritty, it is a very dark, dystopian, kind of post-apocalyptic story about a young girl who becomes a cult leader when society collapses. And then we have the new Avatar, The Last Airbender, the Netflix adaptation. And I thought this was, ah, uh, where do I put it? <laughs> I thought it was a good time, but I also thought it was mediocre. I'm gonna put it at the very top of mediocre, I think, or maybe at the bottom of a good time because I'm gonna put it at the bottom of a good time. I did have a good time watching it. <laughs> And I think that there were a lot of things that were adapted really faithfully. And it's really obvious that the showrunners were fans of the cartoon and that they tried to do things in a way that was faithful to that. But I also felt like the acting wasn't that great. The writing was pretty terrible. Uh, even though the kids were doing the best that they could with the writing they were given, it just fell flat in a lot of areas. And I felt like some things were just like too obviously spelled out. And some characters like Katara really like took a back burner when I feel like Katara and Aang were the two main characters in the show. Katara just felt like a side character in this one. And I didn't really like that as much. I will definitely watch season two. So I, bottom of a good time. That's where it's going. Okay, uh, Martha Wells, All System Red. This is the first book in the Murderbot Diaries, and I'm going to put this in great. I love Murderbot. I've had a good time with all of the Murderbot books, but some of them more than others. So they're all gonna, either going to be in great or a good time. Ghostbusters Afterlife. This came out a couple years ago, I think. I, again, this is another one. I think there is a sequel coming out later this year. But this was a new kind of take on the Ghostbusters universe focused on kids. So it kind of had that Stranger Things feeling to it. The two main kids in this movie are supposed to be the grandkids of Ian, I believe, from the original Ghostbusters movie. So I actually thought it was really great. They have Paul Rudd as like the main person on the poster and he was kind of a side character character in it. But yeah, I was pleasantly surprised with that. It was a good time. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna put that at the top of a good time for right now. Artificial condition. So here's the problem with Murderbot is that they all very much blur together in my mind because the titles of the books don't really tell you very much about what's happening within the book. They all just kind of have like cool sci-fi sounding titles that don't have anything to do with the plot. I don't remember which ones of these are which. I know System Collapse is the most recent one that I read, and I really liked that one, so I'm going to put that up in great. And then I honestly, I think I'm just going to put the rest of them in a good time because I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember which one's which. How many are there? Rogue Protocol. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, so I've read all seven of them. So there's probably like one or maybe two of these that I just put in a good time that should be in great. But again, they all blur together and I'm not sure which ones are which. I think Fugitive Telemetry was like my least favorite one. If that is the one that before the one that just came out, like the sixth one, I'm not sure. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's fine. In general, okay, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna say three of them were great and four of them were a good time. <laughs> that's where I'm cutting it off. I'm all over the place right now, sorry. Okay, Oppenheimer, I just watched r really recently, and I was really pleasantly surprised with that. I would consider that a great film, but also it's just like, because it's so heavy, it's not a movie that I would consider like 
super rewatchable or that I want to watch again and again. You know what I mean? So like, even though it was a great film, it doesn't have that like rewatchability factor. So I'm going to put it at the bottom of great. And it's definitely not a good time. <laughs> okay, Tombstone. This is a Western and I normally do not really like Westerns. I can name like three that I have enjoyed and I've seen probably 15 or, <laughs> or so and didn't really like most of them. Tombstone is the best Western that I've ever seen. So I wouldn't consider this like an overall favorite in terms of like of all of my favorites of the year or whatever. But when I think about Westerns in particular, this is my favorite Western that I've ever seen. So it is going in a new fave and it is a great film. If you haven't seen Tombstone, it's like based heavily on a true story of the shootout at the OK Corral involving Doc Holliday and who's the other guy? Wyatt Earp. <laughs> Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. <laughs> okay, then we have season three of Hilda. I love Hilda. It's a fantastic cartoon show on Netflix and it just has a very like cozy, fantastical vibe with all of its seasons. In season three, they really delved a lot more into Hilda's family, whereas the first two seasons were a lot more about her friends and the world itself. And I really liked it. I would consider it a good time. Yeah, I'm going to put it at the top of a good time. I would consider the show overall great um, or potentially even a fave, but none of the none of the episodes really like stick out to me in season three. So that's why it's going in a good time. Black God's Drums, I would say definitely great. <laughs> this is a very short story or short novella set in like a steampunk alternate reality New Orleans during the Civil War, and it's about a young pickpocket who discovers a big secret. So I would love to see more in this world or a, a novel following the same character like later in life. That would be wonderful. Lone Women, I'm going to put in a good time. Parts of it were kind of unsatisfying, but I still really liked it and would recommend it. It's kind of a, a Eldridge horror pioneer days feeling thing but it also felt like weirdly cozy, even though it was horror. <laughs> it was very hard to like put into a genre, which is why I wasn't entirely sure how to feel about it, but it was it was fun to read. Changing All Stars, I'm gonna put in a good time. I had issues with this book for sure, but overall I like really liked the messaging and what the author was trying to do. It was really ambitious. It was like a, a gladiator style prison system where the prisoners could fight for their freedom and the whole whole book felt like reading a reality tv show which i thought was really unique and cool the deep by river solomon this is a short novella again and it's about basically mer people that are descended from african slaves who were thrown overboard on the middle passage i really like this i thought it was a good time but also it was like depressing and definitely not rereadable so it's going at the bottom of a good time it was a good read. I don't think it was a good time. <laughs> Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead was mediocre. I really liked the idea of this and the writing was really beautiful and it was very poetically written. It is about an Amelia Earhart type figure who disappears while trying to circumnavigate the globe and a woman a hundred years later who's cast to play her in a movie. And there was just a lot of content warnings um, that I didn't know ahead of time, just like a really awful assault, sexual assault, pedophilia, that type of stuff that really took away from the enjoyment of the story for me because all of that was on page. A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor is the sequel to An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, and I would put both of these in A Good Time and High, High Good Time. It's just a duology, it's sci-fi, it's set in our contemporary world. I think they had a lot to say that is super relevant to our world today. The characters were a little annoying, <laughs> but I really liked what Hank Green was doing with the story. Dune Part 2, great. New fave. <laughs> Let's see, and that is definitely like new, new fave. Yeah, I had a really, really fantastic time with Dune Part 2. I was very happy with the adaptation. I'm a huge fan of the book and yeah, I think it was done really faithfully and that the changes that they made were good changes. So yeah, very happy about that. Babel, <sighs> Babel I'm gonna put at the top of great. 
I loved Babel. I did think it was a little too slow, but it's, it's a dark academia book about colonialism, and it's just a really scathing critique of that. The magic system was really neat. The world was really neat. I had a great time with Babel. Call Us What We Carry, I'm gonna say great. This is um, a poetry collection. She really wrote it, I think, during the pandemic. And so it is a lot of pandemic poetry, you know, reflections on George Floyd and loneliness and just the things that were going on in the world at the time. And I thought it was really just perfectly encapsulated what it felt like during that time and so yeah I really really would recommend it if you if you like poetry at all. The Heroes by Joe Abercrombie a new fave for sure yeah probably probably my favorite Joe Abercrombie book that I have read thus far. I am currently reading the sixth book in the series this The Heroes was number five it was my favorite Joe Abercrombie book that I've read so far and I love his books so The First Law has been amazing. <laughs> The Lies of the Ajungo was a good time. This is another short novella. It's about a city that doesn't have any water out in the desert and they send their children out to try and find water so that their society can live on and most of the children die doing so. Definitely not a good, yeah, this is another one that was a good read, but maybe not a good time. <laughs> so it's going towards the bottom. The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. This is the first book in the Stormlight Archive and absolutely is a new fave. At tippity top top of the new faves, I cannot wait to read the rest of the Stormlight Archive. This is my first read through and I just fell in love with the world. The characters are super cool and interesting and I just, oh, I can't wait to see where this series goes. Tremors. Uh, yeah, I just saw Tremors for the first time. Yeah, it was a really good time. It was so stupid and knew it was stupid. It just leaned into it. And uh, I doubt I will ever be inspired to watch any of the sequels, but I'm very glad that I saw Tremors. Let's see, where is it gonna go? Yeah, yeah, I think that's where it's gonna live. Um, the Underground Railroad, another one that is gonna go at the bottom of a good time because it was a good read, but not a good time. <laughs> I should have had a category for that that was like, yeah, what would that category be called? Important reads or something. But they're because they're not a good time, but they were a good read. But The Underground Railroad is about a speculative alternate, you know, Civil War era where the Underground Railroad was actually a underground <laughs> train system to help enslaved people es escape to freedom. Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Davis. I'm going to put in great. Again, like Oppenheimer, it's not like it doesn't really have that rereadability, but it was a very, like, very, very good, important read. Um, it's a series of essays and speeches and interviews that Angela Davis gave in the years like 2013 to 2015 about everything going on in our world, <laughs> specifically related to Ferguson, Palestine, and the interconnection of global struggles for freedom. When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Barnhill was mediocre. Let's see, I would put that right there. This is about a alternate world in which women can turn into dragons. It's considered very taboo, set in the 1950s, and it just follows a girl growing up during that time, and she's not really, she doesn't really know much about it because it's it's such a taboo topic. She can't even bring it up among her own family, even though her aunt turned into a dragon and flew away. I thought the potential of the world and the story was really cool, but I just thought that the way the author chose to tell the story was pretty uninteresting in general. The Adventures of Amina Al-Sarafi is a new fave. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. Shannon Chakraborty, I think, could probably write anything at this point and would be an autobi author for me because I read the David Bob trilogy by her last year and it was one of my favorites of the year. So it's a, a pirate story. <laughs> Emily Wilde's Map of the Otherlands. This is a sequel to Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. I thought it was great, very much in line with the first one. That seems right. And the last thing that I have to add to this list is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. And I thought this was great. Um, where should I put it? I think I'm gonna put it right below Parable of the Talents. Yeah, 
Absolutely loved Little Women. This was a total shocker for me. I didn't expect to love it as much as I did, but I have a whole video where I talk about that. So I will just link that down below if you would like to hear my full thoughts. And yeah, so that is everything that I read or watched for the first time in quarter one. Let me know if this is interesting to you and I can add to it once we're done with quarter two, quarter three, and this will just get bigger and bigger throughout the year, or I could do a new one at that time. Let me know down in the comments below which of these you think I I ranked completely incorrectly if you've seen them and you have very different opinions of mine or just maybe what your favorite thing on this list was or if you haven't seen or watched any of these things or have strong opinions about any of it just let me know what your favorite thing that you watched or read in quarter one of 2024 was thanks so much for tuning in and hanging out with me for a little bit today as always please be kind read books and hit the subscribe button below for more bookish content to come i'll see you soon